Well, happy Mother's Day, church. Okay, you can do better than that for your mama. Come on. Yeah, let's go. Good to be together with you tonight in Mesa and online. Uh, I'm so grateful for Mother's Day. We've been having a good day. And I want to recognize all you moms out here. Uh, Thank you for all your hard work, for your dedication, for your love, for your nurture. Uh, We know how big of a difference you make in that your time as a mom hasn't always been easy. You haven't always been recognized uh, for all the things that you do and all the ways that you sacrifice. But you are the glue of every family And you make the difference in your kids' lives in ways that you don't even know. And you might not know this side of heaven. But I want to say thank you for your dedication. Thank you for those of you who are spiritual mothers as well. For to younger women in the faith, for investing in them and mentoring them and pouring into them. We love you. So let's just give our moms a hand. All of us. Every one of us has a mom. I also just want to say to anyone who is uh, praying about becoming a mom someday or waiting to become a mom, keep on praying, keep on believing, keep on hoping in God's plan for your life to be a good plan and come about at the perfect time. And I want to let you know that praying for a baby is just the beginning of praying for your baby. Amen. It starts out praying, you know, God, give me a baby. And then it turns into, God, protect my baby. They're so little. They're so fragile. I'm just nervous about, and then it turns into, God, protect me from my baby, (laughs) right? You got to learn the power of persistent prayer, and that's what I want to talk about tonight in this prayer series, the power of persistent prayer. Moms know about prayer. You got to keep praying and not give up. I have always struggled with prayer. Maybe that's concerning to you, seeing how I'm a pastor, and you're Second guessing why you were even coming to this church. Like, bro, you, you should probably be good at prayer. Well, I'm not. The way I'm wired as a leader is naturally I want to be more of a doer. And it's harder for me to be a committed prayer just by nature. And so I think a lot of us, we have this idea of prayer, a lot of misunderstandings about prayer that contribute to that frustration. There's so much pharisaical teaching and legalistic thinking around prayer. I've heard it all my life growing up, this kind of teaching, like if you would just pray longer and harder and and less selfishly and, and more fervently, then God would answer. Then we wouldn't have these problems and we would see revival and things would change. And what they're really saying is, well, the reason that prayer is not working is because you're not doing it good enough. The reason your prayers aren't being answered is because you're not good enough. And I don't know about all the ladies in the room tonight, but for guys, we don't like playing games we can't win. So I'll take my ball and go home and find a game I can win. And, you know, the way it leads you to think is, well, maybe I'll never be a prayer warrior. If I can't be a prayer warrior, I can be a hard worker or, you know, a faithful trier. But that's because there's a lot of misperception about why we pray, and the benefits of prayer. Paul Miller said, prayer is the last great bastion of legalism in Christianity. Legalism always ends up making you critical or it makes you quit. Because you come to a point where you think, I've tried, I've tried to live up to this standard. I've tried to become more disciplined. And no matter how disciplined I get, I always just feel like I come up short of an impossible standard. So what's the point? That's why so many people eventually quit legalistic workspace religions, because they realize I can't keep faking it. If your prayer life isn't what you hope it would be or want it to be, then I think this series is for you. I want you to understand that prayer is not something that you need to do better. It's probably just something you need to understand better. It was never meant to be a burden. It was always a benefit available to you through faith in Jesus. It's not a test that you pass or fail. It's a relationship that you enjoy. Some people try to make prayer more simple and their heart's in the right place. And they'll say things like, you know, prayer is just talking to God. And that's not what it just is because you could just talk to a tree. Prayer is more than just talking to God. It's communing with God. It's connecting with God. It's sharing with God. 
In prayer, you will be encouraged and uplifted and inspired and challenged and changed. I've heard so many pastors imply implicitly or explicitly that if you're not praying, you're failing. And what they should say is if you're not praying, you're missing out. I want to explain this. Luke chapter 11. It says, then teaching them more about prayer, he, Jesus, used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough... He will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. We have any shamelessly persistent, hard-headed, stubborn people in the room tonight? Praise God. Let me explain some of the context of this parable. Uh, In this culture, in ancient times, when someone came over your house, you were honor-bound to be a host and provide food and drink for them. And so in this parable, someone comes over your house but you don't have anything to feed them. And in this culture, this would have brought shame on you and your family. And so in the parable, you're like, I can't accept that. Even though it's late, you go out, you go over to your neighbor's house, you start knocking on the door because you know he's got a fully stocked pantry and he can help you. But you're knocking and, and he says, it's late. I can't help you. Go away. But the idea is, you know, you just, you just keep on knocking and because of your shameless persistence and And that word, shameless persistence, in the ESV is translated impudence. It's based on the Greek word anadiaia. And it's the only place in the entire New Testament that this word is used. This word has a negative connotation. It communicates the idea that you are persisting without shame, without embarrassment that you probably should feel, even though you're excessive and extreme, It's like, bro, you're embarrassing yourself. Please stop already. But you don't care. You just keep knocking anyway because you're desperate. And I, I know that sometimes in life, your situation will get desperate enough that all you can do is just call out to God in prayer. And sometimes you just got to approach God that way with desperation, like, all due respect, Lord, but I'm coming at you like a spider monkey, and I'm going to hold on until you give me what I need. And God actually responds to that desperation because it's a reflection of childlike faith. So he goes on to explain this parable in verse 9. He says, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay, so here we get a big teaching, a lesson, and that's what a parable is. It's a story with a lesson, a spiritual principle about our relationship with our Father in heaven and prayer. We learn about the power of persistent prayer, and it's not what I was taught growing up. As I have been studying prayer the last several weeks, I've seen more and realized more than maybe I have for any series in a long, long time, and I discovered that there is a lot of bad teaching about prayer. In this passage, the lesson, based on the example of the bad neighbor, it's a lesson that you learn by contrast. And so really what God is teaching us is that your father in heaven is not like your grumpy neighbor. He's saying, I'm not like that guy at all, at all. In the parable, you go over to your neighbor's house and you knock on the door and he's annoyed that you woke him up. In verse 7, he said, don't bother me. And, and if you knocked on my door at midnight and you're like, hey, can I borrow a cup of flour? I'd feel the same way. Like, what's wrong with you, bro? It's too late for this. Like, don't bother me. Yet, when my little daughter cries out at midnight, I'm kind of excited about it. 
Because, you know, parents with young kids, you know, we put her to bed about 8 o'clock, and it's nice to get a break when she goes to bed. It's like, oh, peace and quiet. But after a couple hours, I start to miss her again because she's adorable. And so when she cries out, all of a sudden I'm like, I'll get her. Amy's like, where were you when I had to brush her teeth to put her to bed? But now I know when she's tired, she's adorable and she's cuddly. And I'm like, I'm about this. I'm here for this. Like, uh, I will go and get her. Because I, I love in that situation, I, I love when she calls out. And your father in heaven feels the same way. Whenever you ask, whenever you call out to him, he loves it. In Luke 11 verse 9, he said, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. So sometimes we worry that we will annoy God with our ongoing asking. And like, isn't he getting tired of my questions and my asking and my needs? And I'm always asking him for stuff. He's probably annoyed with me right now. And that's not the truth at all. We would get annoyed if someone was constantly asking us for help, right? Yeah. Essentially, at a certain point, you'd be like, this person is taking advantage of me. But we got to be careful that we don't make the mistake of viewing God through the lens of our own imperfect character. We are impatient and selfish, but God is incredibly patient and selfless. He loves when you ask. Your father loves when you ask. He's not annoyed. He's delighted every time you call out to him. And in this parable, you go to their neighbor in verse 7. He says, don't bother me. My family and I are all in bed I can't help you. In other words, go away. We're closed for the evening. You ever need help and you can't get it because everything's closed? Last week, my daughter had her first ear infection. And it's, it's terrible as a parent. You know, like you just, you hate to see your kids in pain. And I was worried about her. I knew it wasn't an emergency, like go to the emergency room level serious. But I wanted to do anything I could to help her, and I started looking up urgent cares, you know, to see if I could take her to the urgent care. Honestly, I figured she'd probably be okay, but it was more about me at this point. I would just feel better about, but yet they were closed. They were closed for the night. And so I text my sister-in-law, who's a nurse, and she gave me the number for a nurse practitioner who makes house calls. And I text her, and she's like, you know, give her Motrin. She'll be fine. I'll come over in the morning. And she was so sweet. She was so compassionate. But she did say, I'll come over in the morning. And if I'm being honest, I kind of wanted her to come right now. But it's too late. It's too late for that. And yet you need to understand this. Your father is on duty 24-7, 365. He doesn't have holiday hours. He doesn't go on vacation. He probably, you would think he needs a vacation dealing with all of us, but he doesn't. He doesn't need vacation. He's always there. He doesn't have to divide his attention between you and the other billions of Christians on earth. He can hear all of us completely every time. And that's amazing to know that you can call out to him anytime, day or night. Because I've got great friends and family who would help me in a pinch, but if I call him at 1 a.m., it's going to voicemail because they're asleep. Yeah. They're just humans and they need to sleep. Yet you could wake up in the middle of the night after having a bad dream or being worried. And you could just start talking to your father in heaven. And he's always on the line. He's always listening to you. You can just tell him whatever. Yeah. In verse uh, 4 of Psalm 121, it says, Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. He's always Awake and watching over you and protecting you from the schemes of the enemy before you even realize there's a threat. He's providing for you before you even know you have a need. So you go over in the parable to your neighbor's house and, and he calls out to you and says, the door is locked for the night. The door is locked for the night. So here you are, you're banging on the door. Don't bother me, the door is locked for the night, he says. And it's like, that's frustrating, isn't it? You know, this guy has what you need, but the door is barring you from entry. And this is an important image of how it was between you and God before you put your faith in Jesus. Before Jesus, your sin separated you from God. You could not come near to God because sin cannot come into God's presence. And we know what Jesus did on the cross. His blood was shed for our sins and his blood washed our sins away and made us clean in God's sight. And that's why when Jesus was on the cross, the veil in the temple that separated the holy of holies where God's presence dwelt from the common area was torn from top to bottom. 
Before that, only the high priest, only one person in the whole country could go into God's presence one time a year. But when Jesus died for sin through him, we can come into God's presence all the time. He's always available. And so I want you to know, your father is always accessible. There are no locked doors. There are no times when you cannot get access to your father. And so I want you to understand this is that praying persistently doesn't mean you have to wear God down. A lot of people have this perception based on this parable and in Luke 18, the parable of the persistent widow. And as I've been studying this more, I've realized there's probably more bad teaching based around that parable than any other I think I've ever seen. But they're not teaching that you have to wear God down through persistence. People teach about God like he's a, a slightly nicer version of the grumpy neighbor. Or a slightly more compassionate version of the unjust judge in Luke 18. If you just keep knocking, if you just keep praying, yeah, yeah, he said no the first time, but eventually you're going to wear him out. You can't wear God down. You can't make God do anything. So, so what is it about persistent prayer? What, what's the point? He says in Luke 9, he says, knock and it will be open to you. It's not because he gets annoyed. It's not because you knocked for a long, long time and you eventually just got on his nerves. God, hello, God. I'm just going to keep knocking, okay? Maybe he's going to the bathroom. I don't know. God, God, like, 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 all right already. Like, you think that's how God responds? No. What it says is every time you knock, it'll be open to you. Not after a long time of knocking. Every time you knock. It's like when you're expecting company and they knock because they're trying to be polite and you just say, come on in, the door's open. That's how it is with your father. Every time you knock, hey, come on in, son. Come on in, daughter. The door's open. And because of how good he is, you'll want to go in. And this is one of the reasons why you should pray persistently. It's not to wear God down, you can't. It's because in praying persistently, you discover how good he really is. In Luke 11, verse 11, it says, What fathers among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? That really triggers me as an Arizona resident. <laughs> Dad, can I have some peanut butter and jelly? Uh, no, but here's a snake. <laughs> right? Like, here's a scorpion. Ha! Like, what? What kind of psychopath would do that? And yet, a lot of times, we have this twisted view of God. Like, we can't trust him based on bad teaching. It's like a lot of people, you know, when maybe you had a feisty dad growing up or a practical joker of a dad. Anybody like that? You know, it's, it's not wrong. You know, some people, it's kind of fun to tease your kids. It's just, maybe you had a dad like that where he's like, dad, teach me to swim. And he just picked you up and he threw you in the deep end like, swim, boy. I, it's one way to learn, you know. But a lot of times we develop a mindset about God like that. People will say things like this. Be careful what you ask for. Have you ever heard anyone say anything like that about prayer? Be careful if you ask God for patience. <laughs> He'll make you wait. Oh, be careful if you ask God to make you humble. <laughs> He'll bring you low. And, and so it leaves you hesitant to even ask for anything. Because you're like, but wait, I don't really know what I'm getting myself into here. Like, like, who would do that? Could you imagine my little daughter comes in, Daddy, I was reading in my picture Bible about Jesus, and I want to be more humble like Jesus. What, what if I was like, oh, really? I'm going to shave your head, and that'll keep you from being prideful. Ha, 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 ha. 
Daddy, I want to be more generous. Oh, you do. <laughs> Let's give all your toys away. Then you won't have any toys. That'll teach you to be selfless. And I was like, what sadistic, crazy person would do that to their kid? And yet we've been led to believe that we can't just ask God for good things. No, like if my daughter came and said, Dad, I want to be more generous, I would say, oh, baby, that's so good. I'm so proud of you. You want something good that pleases God. And as your father, I want to help you learn about generosity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase your allowance, and then together we can figure out opportunities to be generous and bless others. Like, and I'm like not even that good of a guy. And so what he's saying in verse 13, if you who are evil, I know a lot of us are like, I'm a good person. No, you're not. <laughs> if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Prayer reveals the goodness of your Father. So often we pray like, we're better parents to our kids than God is to us. But God, he is a good, good father. And there is no evil in him. He's only good. And it's in the process of praying that we start to understand that. Sometimes it's because you'll pray for something and he will act on your behalf. And it can almost be mind-blowing when that happens. This happened to me before when we were building our house uh, I was having some problems with the home builder, and I discovered, you know, there were some things that weren't right. And so I went to them, and I was like, hey, you got to fix this. This isn't right. This isn't supposed to be this way. They started making all kinds of excuses, you know, like, well, you know, like, we can't really do anything. You know, you know how they do it. They just start giving you all the runaround, like, well, we can't really, you know, it's not really our fault. And they really started treating me like I was the problem because I, I, I figured out that there was a problem. And I was getting frustrated after, I'm like, I used up all my polite words. And my wife was like, I need you to lose your chill now. <laughs> so I start wording emails that are just barely pastoral. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just barely. And I'm planning my attack. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get my friend to dress up in a suit and come with me. Pretend he's my lawyer. I'm going to make threats, you know. I'm going to If I have to yell, I'll yell. It's a big deal. It's my house. But, but then I remember, like, okay, I need to pray about this because, you know, I have a father in heaven who said he loves me. And, and, you know, whatever, I should just talk to him about it. So I started praying about, like, God, just help me. I know it's like first world problems and all, but, you know, can you just help me with this? Can you just make a way? Can you just show me favor? And so here I am. I'm gearing up for my strategy to attack and go to war. And my phone rings, and it's the project manager, and he says, hey, Ryan, good news. Even though we've been going back and forth for weeks, he goes, we're going to give you everything you asked for. We got a new boss. This new boss, he says, what are we doing to this guy? It shouldn't be this stressful for him. And I'm listening to this like, what? <laughs> Did God just Jedi mind trick these people? Because I'm pretty sure that's, that just happened. And you come away from something like that and you go, my father in heaven is good to me. And it's not just that he gives you good things because you pray more, but by praying, you catch a lot more of the ways that he's blessing you on an ongoing basis. And so I want to give you a little tip here. You don't have to do this. Remember, this is not legalistic. There's not rules to this. But this is just a tip. Uh, make a list of your prayer requests. Make a list. And, you know, when I heard someone talk about having a prayer list growing up, I always was just kind of like, ugh. This sounds like so much work. And, and this isn't something you have to do, but it's good for you. Let me explain this, right? Because the reason why you want to make a list of your prayer requests is so that, one, you can keep track of the things you're praying for. And remember, remember the things you want. So, like, sometimes you'll ask God for something, and, it, and even though it's important, you'll just kind of forget. 
Or, or you'll stop asking because you already asked once and you think, well, God has a good memory. He doesn't need me to remind him. I don't want to be naggy. But, but having a list and just continuing to pray through it and, and it'll remind you of what it is you're praying for and it'll help you keep track of answered prayers. So you could write down, but maybe you have a lost family member that you're praying for or someone that you're praying for to be healed or a situation that seems impossible and you just need to pray for God to make the mountain move. And, and so this isn't something that I have done for a long time, but getting ready to preach this series, I thought, this is a good thing. Like, I need to start doing this. It seems like a good thing for me to do, and I want to keep better track of all the answered prayers. And so I, I made this prayer list, and on April 27th, one of the things, you know, I wrote down things for me and my family and kids and the church and the country, and I, I remember writing down, you know, prayer requests for the country, and I was burdened just to pray more for our nation, and, and, and even things that seemed impossible, just like bring these things to God because he is a mountain moving God. And so I wrote down, you know, I'm just praying that we would see abortion restricted and come to an end. And then six days later, word leaks out that it looks like Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned by the Supreme Court, which is a huge, huge win for pro-life. And I, in case anyone is uncertain about this, our God is pro-life. Yeah. The Bible is pro-life. God cares about every single baby, no matter how it was conceived. He wants these babies to live. Um, and I know that the world that we live in, they try to make it so complicated and nuanced. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, who are you to say this? And what about this? And it's like, it's not actually that complicated. A baby is a person, and killing a person is murder. It's evil, and it should be illegal because it's evil. I don't have to take an ethics class to figure that out. And I know a lot of Christians are like, well, I'm not really sure what to think about it. Well, spend more time reading your Bible, and you'll figure it out. Now, we need to keep praying about this because it's not a done deal yet, and even if Roe v. Wade is overturned, that's not the end. It just goes back to the states. It will, I think, result in a lot of reduction in abortion. So it's a very, very good thing. So we need to keep praying about that. And here's the deal. A lot of churches won't talk about stuff like this because they think if we talk about abortion, that could hurt the people who've had an abortion. And I understand that. We don't ever want to hurt anyone intentionally. But I have found as a pastor, the women who have had an abortion are usually the most vocal that I should talk about it. And the thing you need to understand is if you don't talk about it, God won't bring healing to it. And so talking about the evil of abortion, it in no way, talking about it in no way takes anything away from the mercy and grace and forgiveness that the Lord extends to everyone who repents of sin. And we're all sinners who've been forgiven. And so we can be both completely against something that is evil and displeasing to God and completely for sinners at the same time. Amen? Amen. So I'm praying about this thing and, and I see six days later this news leaks out and I go to Amy and I'm like, Amy, look! I just wrote this down six days ago! Now I'm not saying I did that. <laughs> but I don't know. All I know is I came out of that situation going, wow, prayer works. That's why you want to keep track of your prayers. And as you see these persistent prayers answer, your faith in God's goodness continues to grow. And that's the key to this. I'm not trying to get you to pray more. I'm not trying to get you to be more disciplined, right? I'm trying to get you to understand God's goodness. And as you understand what prayer really is and how good God is to you, you'll want to pray more, right? It'll take care of itself. I don't necessarily know if God blesses us more when we pray, but I do know that, he, that we notice his blessing more when we pray. And the awareness of his goodness is a blessing all on its own. 
You know, it's like this. If you, if you have kids and you buy them a present for, you know, a birthday, you're, you're not going to take that new toy and, and go and hide it in the kid's toy box with the other toys. And, like, maybe he'll find it. No, it's like, what fun is that? You want to you wanna wrap it up, make a big presentation out of it, and be like, ta-da! Your mom, your dad got this for you, baby, because we love you. Happy birthday. Because them knowing that you loved them enough to give them a gift is half the gift, right? Like, you, you want them to notice, and it's the same with God, right? There are some good things that God wants to give you, but he loves you enough to wait till you'll notice it. And you won't notice it, so you're paying attention. And prayer is what puts your attention on the Father. When you notice his gifts, you notice how good he is. That's what leads to wanting to pray more persistently. How many times does God bless us when we don't even notice it? See, think about this, right? If you only pray for health when you're sick you won't be aware of all the healthy days that God has given you. You'll you'll, you'll get sick and you'll start asking God, like, why did you let this happen to me? Why won't you heal me? Why have you forsaken me? When you've probably been healthy 95% of the days of your life. Think about how many times has God healed you before you even develop symptoms from a sickness? Have you ever thought about this? Like, how many times has God healed a cancerous cell in your body before it multiplied? I bet you'd be more aware of that kind of miracle if you were continuously living in a posture of of prayer and just, God, I ask you for health, and I thank you for the health that I do have. That, That would lead to being more aware of the blessing that he's already given you. Instead, when we don't pray on an ongoing basis, we only notice the problems in our life and never the provision that we've already received. Parents, you do a lot of good things for your kids they're not even aware of, right? It's because they're too little. They don't even understand. They don't, they don't appreciate where you're at when you're working all day. They don't, they don't really like thank you for paying the electric bill. <laughs> no. They, they just know that when they turn the TV on, they can go to YouTube and watch some crazy video. Like, they, don't, they don't even give you credit for that, but you do it anyway because you're a good parent and you love them and you know someday they'll understand what I did for them. It's the same with God. He's constantly doing good things for you that he knows we're not going to fully understand this side of heaven, but we'll, we'll see his goodness in greater ways when we continuously pray. We need to stop pretending we're better parents than our father is to us. God says, I'm actually a loving father and I want to give you good things. And if you'll pay attention to me, I'll show you the good things I'm already doing in your life. Sometimes he reveals his goodness by giving us exactly what we asked for. And other times he reveals his goodness by not giving us what we want. How is that? Because he promised to always give when you ask. But you have to pay attention to what he promised to give you. Rather, who he promised to give you. Come on, do you ever, you ever sometimes go back and read scripture slow and you realize you missed something? Or you gotta, you gotta catch this in verse 13. Like, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You're like, but wait a second, I asked for a raise. But here he is, he's saying, I'll give the Holy Spirit to you every time. It's not that, that he'll always give you everything you ask for, but he will always give you who you need, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not a consolation prize. It's not just a good gift. He, he's the best gift. Sometimes you think you ask God for help, and he said no. You're like, oh, he must have said no. But actually, he just said, yes, it was a yes you weren't listening for. Sometimes you think, you know, I I prayed and I asked God for a spouse and I didn't get one. Guess he said no. I guess he said wait. I prayed, I asked for a baby, I didn't get one. I prayed for healing, I haven't gotten it yet. Sometimes he does give us those things when we ask for them. And other times, he gives us the Holy Spirit who develops in us patience to wait. 
Sometimes he does make the annoying person in your life go away. And other times he gives you the Holy Spirit who helps you love annoying people. Sometimes you go to God in prayer and you're like, Lord, I need you to take away this difficult situation. It's driving me crazy. And he's like, okay. And he gives you the Holy Spirit who develops joy in your heart in the midst of difficult circumstances. When you go to the Lord in prayer persistently, you will always get what you need because this is the key. Listen, it's not about transacting. It's about connecting. So much of the teaching around prayer is, this is how you need to pray if you want to get God to do what you want. This is how to pray in a way that God will respond to you. If you pray like this, God will have to respond to you. He doesn't, he doesn't have to do anything. But we've been taught this. And a lot of times when we go to God with our needs, what we really mean is, God, if you could just take care of this need, it'd be great. I wouldn't have to talk to you anymore. Because that's how we feel about fixing problems in our life. You gotta, it's just like the way we are. You, you got a problem, and so you think, how can we solve this problem so we don't have to deal with this anymore? And that's how a lot of times we think about prayer. But the purpose of prayer is not to not have to come to God in prayer anymore. It's really that the benefits of intimacy are even greater than receiving what we ask for. Because sometimes, honestly, I don't even know what I really want. But the good thing about persistent prayer is that God refines our desires through prayer. And, and part of the power of persistent prayer is that through that process, God helps you discover the true desires of your heart. It's like this. I have, you know, this daughter. She's amazing. She's beautiful. She's sweet. She wakes up sometimes at night and she starts crying. All kinds of different reasons. Sometimes she's sick. Sometimes she's just had a bad dream, or maybe she's cold, or she's just restless. So you go in her room, right? You, I'll walk in her room, and, and she'll cry, and she'll see you, and, and she'll start to say, she'll oftentimes say, I want a bottle. I want a bottle. And I, as her father, I know, you don't really need a bottle at like one in the morning. You already brushed your teeth. She doesn't actually need a bottle. She just associates a bottle with the comfort that she desires. And I, as her father, know all she really needs is for me to pick her up and hold her for a little while. And as I pick her up and hold her, she receives the comfort that she needed in the first place, and she falls back asleep. Yes, that's, so good. that's how prayer works. Yeah. So often we'll come to the Lord with our needs in prayer, and we think we need one thing. But it's actually through the connection time with the Lord that we actually receive another thing. The thing we actually really needed. We just needed a reminder of his love. We, needed, we just needed to, to be near to him. We, we didn't even need the thing that we thought we needed. And, and a lot of times we fire off these quick, these quick prayers like, God, I need this. I want this. And, and they're like whims, you know. It's like a, it's like a whim prayer. And it's kind of like impulsive shopping. You got any moms in the room? You ever done some impulsive shopping? Yeah, it happens to all of you, you know? It's like you go, you, go shop, you go on a shopping date with your girlfriends, and they're always liars. They're like, that, girl, that looks so good on you. It doesn't. They, that's just what girls say to each other. They, they never say it doesn't look good on you. You know what I'm saying? And, and so you buy it, and you go home, and you're like, why did I even buy this? I don't even like it. And, and that's how it is with prayer sometimes. We'll ask God, like, God, give me this. God, give me that. And, and in reality, it's good for us to bring those silly, impulsive prayers to God. It is good. And as we continue to, to bring them to him and we connect with him, he starts to change the things we see and, and, and want. He doesn't give us what we ask for every time, but he always gives us what we need. Sometimes we'll go to him impulsively and we'll just be like, God, I need more money. God, I need you to fix my wife. She's so annoying. God, I need you to make these difficult people in my life go away. And God just comes close and he says, I'm so glad you brought this need to me. And he just holds us. And we just connect with him. And he starts to, to show us love. And he doesn't rebuke. Like we think of God as being so mean. But he doesn't rebuke us like, oh, you're so immature. He just says, hey, hey, buddy, I love you. I love you so much. I'm so, I'm so glad. You know what? I, I'm glad you told me you want more money. Uh, but really, you just needed me to remind you of how trustworthy I am to provide for your needs. 
You need, you need to me to remind you of all the good things you already have in your life. Hey, man, I, I, know, I know you want me to fix your wife. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that to me. Really, but what I wanted to do is show you why you're getting annoyed so that I could help you grow more mature. Or like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm glad you told me about all those annoying people. I get it. I get it. But really, you know, I, I want to help you to show love to these difficult people. And he always gives us what we need when we ask. He always gives us sometimes what we ask for and other times just the Holy Spirit. And it says in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Sometimes he gives us love for the people who are causing us problems or joy in the midst of suffering or peace in the midst of chaos or patience to wait or kindness when we feel like flexing our power Goodness when we want to do wrong. Self-control when we think we can't take anymore. And as you keep praying, good things just keep happening. Right? Sometimes you pray and he's like, okay, here you go. And other times he's like, here's the Holy Spirit. And you just keep praying. And then you see like, he answered that prayer. That's awesome. And you keep praying. And other times he's like, and here's some more Holy Spirit, <laughs> some patience to wait. And as you continue to commune with him in prayer, and you don't see it so much about transactional exchange, but more connectional time with someone who loves you, you realize more and more how good your father is, and you start praying more, not because you're trying to achieve a level, a level of prayer, that will please him, but because you realize how good he is and how pleased he already is with you. We see an example of this with Jesus where he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. I talked about this last week, and just to pick up with this again, the night before that he was going to die, Jesus went and he prayed. He says, he, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In verse 42, it says, he went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible, see the prayer changed, for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And then it goes on to say, he came back a third time and prayed the same thing. So this is really a great example of prayer that's not transactional, it's relational. He, he wasn't praying and continuing to pray to get freedom from the cross. He was praying and continuing to pray to get the strength to endure the cross. And this came from time spent with his father. It doesn't happen immediately. You have to pray persistently to get the full benefit. Jesus, he, he prayed three times, and in that process, he experienced this. There's a saying I heard, first, prayer changes the prayer, then prayer changes the prayer, and then prayer changes your life. So first, persistent prayer changes the pray your, the pray your, the person. So Jesus started out probably feeling incredible anguish. The Bible says he was sorrowful unto death, and he was so much anguish that capillaries burst in, in, his, in his body, and he sweat blood because he was so stressed about what he was facing. And, and yet we see how it shifted for him, and I, I'm sure anxiety shifted to peace and fear shifted to courage you ever experience something like that where you you pray and, and that process of prayer starts to change you yeah. even if god doesn't you know like i've had times like that where people are like driving me crazy and i'll pray the bible over them like psalm 35 it says fight my enemies attack my attackers <laughs> Let all who want to kill me be disgraced and put to shame. I'm, I'm like, yeah. Get them, God. That's biblical. I'm not sorry. And, and so, like, I'll have these people that are bothering me, and I'll pray that, you know, like, God, get my enemies. Protect me. Strike down the foe who opposes me. And, and here's what you think God would do in that situation. You think he would just be like, Ryan, you're such a brat. <laughs> right? Like, what's the matter with you? You're selfish. There's no way to talk about your mother-in-law. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but that's not the way it usually works, right? It's in the process of prayer that he starts to change you because prayer is more about relationship and connection than transaction, just getting what you want. So when you pray, it's like you're putting yourself hand in hand with the Father who loves you. And through prayer, you're spending time with him. And even if you start out praying silly prayers or immature prayers or bratty prayers, right? Your father responds to you with amazing grace and love because that's just who he is. And he'll say, buddy, I understand you're upset. Come, come be with me. Let me love you. And, and just this time connecting with your father and receiving his love, it starts to change you as the prayer. You, you thought he was going to rebuke you for, for praying the wrong kind of prayers, right? Like, what's wrong with you? But really, he just wants to love you and celebrate everything that's right with you. That you're his son, and you're made holy, and you're adopted into his family, and that you're growing. And he does this by revealing his love to you. He's just loving, and he's been kind to you, and he's been good to you, and he's removed your sin, and he doesn't remember your guilt anymore, and He's given you heaven in place of hell, and he's patient with you when you fall. With you when you fall, and, and you start to experience reminders of, and, and this kind of love as you pray persistently. And what happens is that changes you, and the way you see the world. And that's why a lot of times the meanest people on earth are the ones who feel the least loved. They usually don't even know what love love looks like, let alone how to give it. So you just, just connect with your Father and you receive love and then persistent prayer changes your prayer. When you experience his love through prayer, it starts to change the way you pray. So you might have started out like, Father, I'm so mad about my crazy boss and, and my psycho family, you know, like, I can't handle it anymore, you know. I just need you to help me get through it. This holiday season's coming up. I don't know if I can handle it. And, and then you start to pray and you're just like, man, you're just like thinking about yeah, you, you, you really do love me. You'll help me. You'll help me get through it. You, al- you always help me get through it. You're just really faithful, and you love me. And I mean, I'm, re- I'm really, really thankful for all the, the times you've loved me, even when I've been difficult. And, and pff, you probably will even help me get through this difficult situation with my family. And, you know, my, my family probably hasn't experienced love the way like I I have from you. My my boss probably hasn't experienced this kind of love you've shown me. Hmm. I, I, I pray that they would experience your love. I see what you're doing here. I, I pray that you would help me to love my crazy boss and my psycho family, okay? I, 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 like, it's not like I just got super holy all of a sudden. I just spent time with the one who loves me, and that changes me, and that changes the way you pray. Your impulsive prayers get refined, and God refines your desires, and the more you spend time with him, the more your heart aligns with his heart. Really, God, he's just giving you time, a lot of the time, to figure out what it is you really want. We often think about how prayer will lead us into God's will, but sometimes he wants to lead you into what you really want, and you figure it out by praying persistently. There are some things... Uh, that you want, that you won't figure out until you spend time with your father and let him change you, which changes your desires and the way that you pray. My friend James McDonald, he said, in prayer, God is making us spiritually fit to receive what he's already willing to do. And that's how persistent prayer changes your life. There's some things that just take a while and you just got to keep praying. And it's in the process of, of praying that God is developing you to receive the thing that he already wants to give you. We've experienced this in our life. There was a time, you know, we had gotten married, me and Amy, and after about a year and a half, we started 
trying to have a baby, and it just didn't happen right away. And I was like, well, that's weird, but I am willing to keep trying. <laughs> so about another year goes by, and it hasn't happened, and we're like, that's not normal. So we go to the doctor, and they're like, oh, you have this thing, like unexplained infertility. And so I remember like just the first time calling out to God and just being so heartbroken and sad and disappointed and anguished. Just like, God, why are you doing this to me? Like, what is this? Like, why is this happening? What did I do to deserve this? Like, are you punishing me for something? I was praying all these silly, immature, theologically incorrect prayers, but that's okay. God doesn't care. He just wants us to pray. He just wants us to come to him with our prayers. He just wants us to come to our Father. And, and so, thankfully, soon, you know, I started to feel some sense of like, okay, well, we got to keep praying about this because God, he, he can do the impossible and nothing is impossible. We started praying, you know, God, help us to, to get pregnant and have a baby. And we would pray and people would pray for us. We could pray that you'll get pregnant. And we were like, yeah, it's possible. And, and as we kept praying, you know, we really started to feel a lot more faith and a lot more peace. And, and, and we, we started to realize, like, you know, we, we aren't receiving the baby that we want yet. But there are a lot of benefits to being, you know, dual income, no kids and having our nights all to ourselves. It's like every night's a date night. You started to see, like, the positive side in it and kept praying, kept praying. And just like, God, we want to get pregnant and have a baby. And then it started to shift it started to shift, and it was like, man, you know, God, we just, we just want a baby. We just, we just trust you, and you're so good. And, and in the process of prayer, he was just changing us and opening our hearts up. And, and in the process of connecting with our Father in heaven and, and really just sitting in what it's like to be his son, to be his daughter, it makes you more aware of your status and how much he loves you as his adopted kids. And I started, I started just opening up my heart, and I had a friend come into my life who talked about adoption. It was something I would have never considered before. I, I wasn't even open-minded to it, but when it came up, it was like the Holy Spirit said, yes, that's what I want for you. And I was like, really? What? But then I realized, like, yes, that is what God has for me. And so we started to pray, like, God, we just want a baby, however it's your will for us to have a baby. And so we started going through this adoption process, and it was so annoying. There's so much paperwork and so much red tape and bureaucracy. It's so frustrating. So we're just praying, like, God, we trust you. And, like, one, one potential adoption kind of situation came up, but then it fell through. And we were like, oh, disappointed, but just keep praying. And then we got this call, and there was a, a, a young woman who got pregnant in a very unstable situation, and she, she was already struggling, and so she was considering abortion and her mother said well why don't you think about adoption instead and so she she got a list of adoption agencies and she picked one that had Christian in the name and she went to their website and she said I want these people to adopt the baby growing inside of me this Ryan and Amy people that I'm seeing here and from the very beginning and she was like well, I want these people and it was like God just orchestrated this whole thing. This beautiful little girl came into our life, and, and, and we have a good relationship with the birth mom. And uh, that's that in, in the adoption world, that's what you call you know, her, like a birth mom or a biological mom. Amy is her actual mom, just in case you didn't know that. Um, but we just love her, and we're so grateful for her. And, and we're also so grateful for this little daughter we have, so beautiful, so precious. And, and we now we realize if it had happened any other way, if God had given me what I asked for the first time, I wouldn't have gotten this better yes. My, my sweet daughter... That's how prayer changes your life. Sometimes his will is different than you wanted, but it's always better than what you could have imagined. And we see this happen, how prayer can change your life. So I want to encourage you, don't give up praying. If you've got something big in your life, keep praying. And, and, and prayer is not about trying to wear God down and get him to do what you want. E. Stanley Jones, he said, If I throw out a boat hook from a boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? 
Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but aligning my will to the will of God. This is what Jesus discovered in the garden. This is what the Apostle Paul discovered when he had a problem and three times he asked God to take it away. But the Lord said, my grace is all you need and my power works best in your weakness. And so it changed the way he saw his life and the way he prayed and the way he lived. Sometimes you do get what you want and you've got to pray about it because you wouldn't even notice the blessing if you weren't paying attention in the first place. But sometimes when you pray, God, he gets you on a different path by showing you a different way of seeing the world around you and and showing you what he actually wants for you, his, his heart. And I mentioned in Luke 18 the parable of the persistent widow. And it's coming to an end here. A lot of times people do teach, like, if you just keep praying persistently, you're gonna wear God down, you're gonna wear him down. That's not the point of persistent prayer. But here is one of the reasons you should pray persistently. In verse one, Jesus told them a parable to show them that they should always pray and not lose heart. Sometimes when you ask God for something, you have to wait. We hate to wait. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. I'm not even going to pretend I like to wait. Like I had to wait for my baby. right? But if you don't pray persistently, waiting can become very dangerous to your soul. In Proverbs, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when you have to wait a long time, it's easy to lose hope. And when you don't have hope, you can become heart sick. But when you pray persistently, it prevents you from losing heart. If you always pray, you'll never lose heart. Because you stay connected to the person who is your source of hope. And even as you wait, you're reminded of God's faithfulness and his love. So you keep on praying. What are you praying for today? Are you praying for healing? Are you praying for a prodigal child to be saved, come home? Are you praying for a breakthrough in your family, for a marriage to be restored? Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Sometimes God's going to say, yes, here you go. Sometimes he's going to say, here's the Holy Spirit who's going to help you wait. Other times he's going to give you peace in the middle of a difficult situation. But just keep on praying. Keep on praying. And I'm closing with this, Romans 12. He says, rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to come to you in prayer and to bring you our needs and to commune with you, our Father who loves us. I pray for every single person in our church family that every single need we have, we will bring to you in prayer and not out of a desire to be better Christians, but to benefit from our our relationship and our access to you, our Father. I pray that we will discover your goodness more through prayer and see all the ways that you've already blessed us and the ways that you want to bless us, that through prayer we'll become more like you and we'll see the things the way you see them and want the things that you want and our will will be conformed to your will. And and so, Lord, we just come to you today as your children and we're depending on you, we're trusting in you, we offer every situation up to you. I pray you'll stir up a faith in your people to pray boldly and persistently that our church would just rise up with new prayers of faith in the coming days and that we'll discover the power of persistent prayer. We believe for breakthrough. We believe for the impossible. We believe for miracles. In Jesus' name, amen.